Before we begin, uh, let me say that we are missing Justice Gaziano, who lives in Situate. I need say no more. Uh, he, will, he will be participating in, uh, in our discussion and will be considered to be on the panel. And Justice Lank, as you know, has had health issues, but she is listening as we speak, and she will also be joining us for the discussion. So you should consider them as if they are here, because they will be participating in the decision. With that, you may proceed. SJC 12435, Chelsea Collaborative, Inc. and others v. <coughs> William F. Galvin. Mr. Kravitz, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. The plaintiffs and the secretary agree on quite a lot in this case. Most of the facts are stipulated. And more importantly, they agree that Massachusetts can and should allow voters to register and vote on election day. Where they disagree is on who decides. The secretary has asked the legislature to implement this policy change to our uh, voting regulations. And that is consistent with nearly 200 years of precedent from this court, beginning with Capon, uh, that has consistently and repeatedly emphasized that the legislature has the authority to implement and to regulate voter registration. So that, that's a good point. So you're, you're focusing on separation of powers, and, and, and if we're going to have um, same-day re uh, voting registration, maybe that is a legislative prerogative. But the fact that the secretary of state is advocating that position. Doesn't that say something about how much a burden it would be if you didn't have 20 days to deal with uh, people who are registering? Well, I don't see that the, that, the, that the proposal to implement election day registration goes to the burden, Your Honor. The, Why not? The question of the burden is, does the existing law, the question is, is the existing law constitutional or not? And uh, in order to assess that under the sliding scale test, which uh, we and, and 30 years of cases in jurisdictions around the country have, have uh, uh, accepted as the correct test, you first assess, does the current law impose uh, a, a severe burden on uh, the rights of voters? And if it's severe, you apply strict scrutiny. If it is not severe, it's more, it's a more of a rational basis sort of inquiry. And the question in severe burden cases is consistently, and this, this, you see this throughout the cases that have applied this test, does the existing law make it impossible or unreasonably difficult to comply with the law? I'm looking at it the other way. Uh, election day registration, the reason that there's the 20 days uh, is so that you can make sure that the voters are qualified and make sure that um, the election is orderly. Now, if you can have um, same day voter registration on election day, then clearly that concern about orderly elections and qualifications of voters must not be that compelling or difficult. Uh, well, I, I, I obviously would not agree with that characterization, Your Honor. Uh, what I would say is this. First of all, it's important to understand that the Secretary's proposal to implement election day registration, and this is true of most states around the country, not all, but most that have election day registration, is that under the Secretary's proposal, there would still be a 20-day period in which you cannot register. So uh, uh, in-person and, and online and so on, registration will end on day 20. Then there are 20 days when other things are happening. Most notably, I would say, early voting is happening. It would be like a 20-day blackout Correct, period. exactly correct. Mm -hmm. uh, the 20-day blackout, and then on election day itself, voters can come to the polls and, uh, and, and there will be uh, systems in place to allow registration mm -hmm. at that point. But, and, yes. will there, and will their ballots be provisional? No, Your Honor, they will not be provisional. Provisional ballots uh, will essentially, uh, I don't know that they'll be completely eliminated, but they will be cut down on because the principal purpose of, uh, of provisional ballots is to uh, give someone uh, a possibility of voting when they don't appear on the list. And with election day registration, that problem is solved because you can put them on the list by registering at the polls. Now, counsel, can you discuss for a moment the difference between a qualification and a registration requirement and where that really started and, and ends in the case law? 
Uh, yes, absolutely, Your Honor. So, the, 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 and this court has been extremely clear about this, really, from, from the days of Capon versus Foster in 1832. The qualifications for voting are those that are set forth in Amendment Article 3, and they are uh, citizen, citizenship, age, residence, that sort of thing. And the law is clear that the legislature cannot uh, add or subtract from the qualifications. But the cases are equally clear, and this is true of Capon, Kinnean, all of the cases that, that, uh, that have talked about this issue. The law is equally clear that the legislature may, and in fact must, put in place some sort of system in order to ascertain who is qualified and who is not. Because the last line of Article 3, after it says these voters shall be entitled to vote, Article 3 then says, and no other voter, and no other person shall be entitled to vote. But it does not explain how you tell the two classes apart. So that is left to the legislature. And Capon has made clear that, uh, that the, the legislature uh, is then empowered to put in place systems to ascertain who has the qualifications and Just, who doesn't. Justice Wilkins relied a lot on Kameen in terms of structuring the analysis around necessity and, and all of that. Um, m my reading of Kaneen was that was more of a qualification than a registration requirement. Absolutely correct. So what makes what makes the difference between calling this waiting? What's the difference if we call this 20-day period a waiting period of qualification or a waiting period for registration? Well, the purpose. So under the current law, the purpose of the 20 days is precisely to make sure that we have accurate lists so that we know uh, who is properly duly registered and who is not. It is also to allow uh, local election officials to run an orderly election, and we know from the record that uh, there is a lot to do in those 20 days, but, including but, but, managing but, early voting. But you've just told us that the secretary doesn't believe that he needs it because he now is pre preparing to have same-day voting without even provisional ballots. Uh, but again, Your Honor, it's, it's really important to keep in mind that we are not, the Secretary has not proposed eliminating the 20-day blackout. I understand period. that. And, and, and indeed, Judge Wilkins did not establish a remedy. Correct. He declared it unconstitutional. He said it's going to go on appeal. Let, let the SJC figure out a remedy. And we'll discuss that in due course if we get to the issue of remedy. Uh, but uh, I'm a little bit perplexed in that you're saying the legislature has said it's necessary, but the secretary says it's not. So the legislature, it, let, let me uh, try to clarify what I mean by the appropriate test. Um, as, as Justice Cipher was pointing out, the Superior Court found a necessity test in the language of Kinnean. Respectfully, I think that is a misreading of Kinnean. I think what Kinnean did is it, it simply adopted everything that Capon laid down, which was a test of reasonableness. And so reasonableness is not an entirely self-defining concept, but the way the courts have approached this question over the years, here and elsewhere, here in the Libertarian Association case and elsewhere in, in cases that present facts very similar to this one, is, is this two-part question of is the burden that the existing law places on voters a severe one? And to just give you an example of what a severe burden looks like, we can simply look to the Scott case in Florida. The question there was, uh, again, it is a deadline case, 29 days in advance of the, uh, in advance well, of so the election. So let me ask you, inter or for my, so is the test the same? Is that what you're saying, whether it's a, a qualification or a registration requirement? Because you're saying both well, Kaneen and Capon have, go through this reasonableness. But aren't, isn't there a difference depending on, on how we look at it, whether it's reasonable? If it's a registration requirement versus qualification? Well, if it were, a, yes, it, it, it would be different. So what's the difference in the test, I guess? The different, I guess the difference in the test is to say that, uh, you know, a, a qualification is some new requirement beyond those in Article 3, and it is not designed to, uh, it would not be designed to assess those that are in Article 3. The problem in Kinnean, again, the problem in Kinnean is that, they, that uh, the legislature had imposed a new rule that applied only to naturalized citizens. And if I can just read you from, this is at page 503 of that case. A statute regulating the exercise of the right of suffrage or the ascertainment of the qualifications of voters must not only be reasonable in its character, but uniform and impartial in its application. And the court, that's, that was where, where the court found the problem was in Kinnean. It's, it, you know, in a way, it's an equal protection case. It says you have two classes of citizens here, those who are naturalized and those who are native born, and you're treating them differently. You cannot do that. There's can no reason to do can, that. Can you have um, a sliding scale test and still have heightened scrutiny? 
So, uh, yes, I mean, you can. The, the, the purpose is to separate those cases where voting is truly difficult, and, and those are what we call the severe burden, strict scrutiny cases, from those where the burden is less on voters. And then, you know, without wanting to get too hung up on the labels, uh, you can call it rational basis, you can call it rational basis plus, uh, whatever label you sort of choose to put on it. The question, I think, is consistently when we're dealing with non-strict scrutiny cases, the question is always going to be, is, is the state's rule a reasonable and non-discriminatory rule that is uh, a way of advancing the state's legitimate interests? That's how this court has described the test, both in Libertarian Association and in Gillespie. That's how the Supreme Court described the test in Burdick. Can I, uh, can I read you sort of what I thought was the key sentence in, in our case? Thus, to evaluate the constitutionality of state ballot access regimes, the U.S. Supreme Court has developed a sliding scale approach through which courts weigh the character and magnitude of the burden the state rule imposes on the plaintiff's rights against the interest the state contends justify that burden and consider the extent to which the state's concerns make the burden necessary. Is that the test you want us to apply? Well, I think the test. Scale test. It is a sliding have, scale test. And it does seem to have the word nece necessary in it, right? Because we've got three tests to sort out here, right? Yeah. And you lose under the strict scrutiny test, right? That's correct. And you win under the rational basis test. Correct. And now we've got the middle test, which it's not so clear. Well, I, th I think the I think the 20-day rule is, is clearly uh, clearly passes. Uh, I guess we would call the middle test, and the reason for that is that again, if you look at the record in this case, I, I just was focusing on the last part of the sentence: the extent to which the state's concerns make the burden necessary. So the state's concerns here are to have an orderly election day, right? It, essentially, yes. Right. And is the burden here making it 20 days? necessary again I think the record strongly supports that that uh, at least if you're not applying strict scrutiny right then, I get then strict, strict scrutiny there are less restrictive means to correct but you know this burden necessary I just can't distinguish whether the burden here is necessary particularly because you seem to be able to do this within five days so the five-day point is a really important one, and I'd like to address that if I could. What the record shows <clears throat> is that right at the deadline of registration on day 20 before the election, you have a huge spike in registration activity. This is at page 1467 of the appendix. You can see it there. There's a graph that shows what happens at the deadline. And the record then shows that over the next five days, working weekend, working the weekend, working overtime, uh, most, though not all, of the municipalities were able to process all of those voting registrations in time for early voting to begin. Then we have early voting. And what the record shows about early voting, again, is that the elections, uh, local elections officials, made it work, but it was not easy. They were taxed uh, really sort of beyond the capacity. Mr. Salerno from Somerville testified that he was working from 7 in the morning until 11 o'clock every night, that his staff was working similarly extremely long hours. Uh, this is all to manage the early voting process that consumes the two weeks, uh, the two full weeks before Election Day. So uh, they were able to do it, but it was a strain. And what, so I, I think what the record clearly does not show is that if you shorten the deadline so that you're going to 10 days or seven days or five days, then what you are doing is moving that spike of registration activity into the period when early voting is already happening. And so at that point, you are asking local election officials to sort of do everything at once, process this last minute flood of voter registration, manage an orderly early voting, which has turned out to be very popular among, among voters. And at some point, you know, we don't have evidence in the record because I don't know how you would develop such evidence that says, well, this would be impossible. That, that's not in the record. But what we do, but the, the Superior Court it himself acknowledges, this is at page uh, 662 of the appendix, the Superior Court says, at some point it's going to be impossible. We don't know exactly what that point is. But this is the showing, I think, that we need to make in order to satisfy uh, the, the test that you describe from a Libertarian Association or any other, you know, again, there are sort of minor differences of verbiage from the different cases. But 
but any test other than strict scrutiny. What we need to show is that the regulation that is in place advances the state's legitimate interests, and, and when it comes to orderly elections, compelling interests. I may have missed it, but did you explain why, um, given that difficulty, it's, o it's, uh, it's okay or you, it, it's, you can do election day registration? How is that possible given the difficulty with the needing the 20 days to get to early voting? Well, I think the point is that once those 20 days are over and we've gotten to Election Day, essentially everything that has to be done in preparation for Election Day has been done. And so at that point, um, it, it's, I mean, it, it of course, is, it will be an experiment. It's never been done here before. But, uh, our, but the Secretary's impression from other states that have implemented Election Day registration successfully is that we should be able to do it here as well. And uh, I, one assumes that if the legislature chooses to take this up, they will, they will uh, provide adequate funding and uh, undertake whatever other preparations are required in order to make it work smoothly. So this means the group of people who are, are burdened would be the, those who couldn't do early voting because they could come in and register on the same day and, and vote on election day. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, give me that one more time. I'm just trying to figure out who, if Election Day uh, registration is implemented, then the people who are burdened by the 20-day um, blackout period mm -hmm. are only those who aren't able to vote early. Because if you don't vote, if you don't register by the 20-day cutoff, mm -hmm. you can still come in and register and vote on Election Day. On Election Day, that's correct. Okay. That's correct. Uh, yeah, right. You, you, you uh, under the under the proposal that is uh, that the secretary has made. Uh, you would not be able to register and vote on one of the early voting days uh, if you had not already done so. There are, uh, there's something called same day registration where you can also do that. My understanding is that is not the proposal that's on the table. If I can uh, turn you to a fourth standard, uh, which you sort of brought up essentially in your reply brief when you said if we go here, then are we going to be then addressing limitations on the voting hours on the day <coughs> of election. You know, why not 5 a.m. till 10 p.m.? Right. Uh, in the realm of the First Amendment, well, there is a right of peaceable assembly, agreed. It is a fundamental right, agreed. Uh, and yet we establish time and place restrictions that we say are appropriate with regard to that. But the standard is that it those time and place restrictions must be both reasonable, not content-based, and narrowly tailored to accomplish their purpose. Should we not apply the narrowly tailored to accomplish their purpose to this particular time and place restriction on the fundamental right to vote? So uh, I think the First Amendment and, uh, context is a good analogy because you do have this, uh, as, as you point out, you have these time, place, and manner restrictions that actually do prevent people from speaking when they may want to, and yet we don't analyze them under strict scrutiny. I think that in the voting area, uh, that is not the way, what you describe is not the way the jurisprudence has developed. Well, so I understand that, but we have the privilege as the SJC of being able to shape our jurisprudence. <laughs> Uh, and the question is whether or not narrowly tailored, as opposed to this shifting scale where we have to evaluate the severity <coughs> of the burden, and I'll ask you in a moment whether we're supposed to do empirical studies as the judge appeared to have done with regard to that, but this wouldn't obligate us to do that. This would say it's a burden. I think you agree it's a burden. It's gonna affect the Correct. number of people who Correct. will be able to yes. vote. Uh, so let me ask you, let's imagine the possibility uh, that we say the real standard should be whether it's narrowly tailored. Mm -hmm. uh, can you meet that standard? Uh, can, can we beat that standard? Uh, on, on can the you meet, not beat, can you meet? Can we meet? <laughs> Can we, I mean, again, in this case, uh, because the secretary has put election day registration on the table, if what we are looking for is uh, a situation where we must have the least restrictive possible system in place, then no, we do, we, we would not meet that. Again, standard. it's not. Uh, this is a somewhat. This is a somewhat different standard. It's a, that's. It's a narrowly tailored means that. The least restrictive is, I understand the issue, and you've raised it with in your reply brief. Right. Uh, 
you know, do we then say it's got to be 24-hour voting on election day? I understand that. Okay. Uh, so I'm asking about narrowly tailored. Would is what is the 20-day narrowly tailored to the needs to maintain the integrity and uh, of an election? I would say that it is, Your Honor, for the reasons that I was uh, that I was explaining earlier. Given what the record shows in in, in this very case about the, the necessity to run uh, an orderly election. Nobody wants disorderly elections and, and long lines and confusion at the, at the check-in station about whether you're, in, whether you're on the list or not. That doesn't serve anybody's interests. And so if, if what you're suggesting is narrowly tailored, maybe there's a little bit more play in the joints than there is if we apply a sort of a, a, a real least restrictive means test then it seems to me the 20-day rule under the circumstances that we have now, given the existence of, of, of early voting in the two weeks before election day that takes up most of those 20 days, then the need to uh, test the voting machines, which took uh, essentially three and a half days uh, of just doing that in Somerville, the need to uh, uh, you know, hire, train, poll workers, all of the things that have to happen in order to run an orderly election. It seems to me that unless we are applying a strict least restrictive means test, then, uh, then the 20-day rule does seem to me to fall within that sort of parameter. Does, uh, the, does the judge's fact finding, I mean, they're, they're pretty negative in the sense of some of the arguments you're making. Does the judge seems to think it's manageable to do this, right? I mean, he, he has a number of fact findings about same-day registration being possible. So right. how do we uh, deal with the facts here? That he's so uh, I, I, what I would say is that <clears throat> we obviously don't disagree with any of the fact findings having to do with the possibility of election day registration. That's why the proposal is on the table. Uh, I, I do not think there is any finding of fact from the, uh, from the Superior Court that, that said, and nor is there any evidence on this point, that says uh, that you could take the spike of, uh, of registrations that happens at the end of the period, move it into the early voting period, and have all of that work out. In fact, I think that is exactly why the Superior Court acknowledges that at some point it's going to be impossible. Uh, so there is, no fact, there is no finding of fact on that question. The Superior Court seems to say at some point that um, you're just moving the responsibilities around. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's fair enough, but if you move them all into the same place, uh, that does not necessarily answer the question. Now, let's assume for the moment that you prevail in persuading us that severity of the burden should be the standard. How do we measure the severity of the burden? We, we, we know from the judge's fact finding that roughly one to three percent of voters would vote, but for the 20-day rule. Right. Is that so not, is that, is the, is the denial of their right to vote not a severe burden? I, I think the way to look at the severe burden question is, is simply to compare it to other, th there are a lot of cases that have faced issues very similar to this one. So if we look at the Scott case in Florida, it's, a, it's, a, it's another deadline case. But what happens in that case is five days before the end of the deadline, Hurricane Matthew hits Florida, and thousands of people have to flee their homes, government offices are closed, U.S. mail is suspended. So for those five days, for people who were qualified to vote, wanted to register to vote, were within the period when they should have been able to register to vote, and they literally had no way to do it. It was not possible for them to comply. Okay, so, so there, is some, there, was some, there was some larger percentage in Florida who would have been deprived of their ability to vote. Well, no, I think the point is that, for, that in that situation, the combination of the storm and the regulations were such that, you had, that it was not possible to comply with the rule. So you're, you, you view the burden in just to essentially say it's a burden on persons that they really have to get their act together and register within 20 days, that that's how you're going to measure the burden as opposed to the fact that for whatever reason, a lot of people for various, for various things going on in their lives or whatever are simply not focusing on the election and then say, oh dear, now I've missed the deadline. So there are two dimensions to, uh, to the question of burden. And one is this one, and I think uh, it, it, this is supported by the cases. We there, there are one, two, three, there are six cases at least 
where a pure deadline with no sort of extraordinary circumstances like the hurricane have been uh, in play. And in each one of those cases, the Rutgers case from New Jersey, Diaz from Florida, Berea from Oregon, Acorn from Connecticut, Rosario from New York, Burns and Marston from Georgia and from Arizona, all of these cases just face pure deadlines and, and none of them conclude that the fact of a deadline by itself, standing alone, is, is a severe burden. Well, but you, what's your response to the plaintiffs? They're saying cognate provisions of the Declaration of Rights uh, hold the fundamental right to vote is more precious, is more evidently of a pillar of, of, of liberty than the interpretation from Rosario versus Rockefeller in the United States Constitution. I mean, as, uh, as you're well aware, of course, the court is, has the authority to uh, expand uh, the right beyond, for example, what is protected in the federal courts. I would just suggest that, uh, for, for, well, for one thing, the Rutgers case is a state constitutional case, and the state provision in that case in New Jersey is very similar to Article Three. It lists qualifications, and then it says people who have these qualifications shall be entitled to vote. And the argument raised in Rutgers was virtually identical to the one raised here. Rutgers is a 21-day deadline. The plaintiffs in that case said uh, uh, thousands of people are, are unable to vote because of the deadline, because they don't meet the deadline for whatever reason, and uh, therefore you should apply strict scrutiny and throw it out. And the court uh, simply this court concluded that in light of uh, the record in that case, which looked a lot like the record in this case, numerous places to register, wide, widespread publicity of, uh, of the fact of the deadline coming up. Uh, here, there's even more evidence. We have online registration. We have the, the uh, information guide that is mailed to literally every household in the Commonwealth that has a registration card in it and has information about the deadline. All of that led the court in the Rutgers case to conclude that there was not a severe burden. Now, I, so let me, uh, to return to, uh, to Chief Justice Gantz's question, if I could, um, the other dimension of, of burden is, of course, the impact on the voter. And, 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 and that is not to be disregarded, but I would point to, to for example, this court's decision in Cephalonis, where that is sort of the ultimate severe burden case where not only is it impossible to comply because you have prisoners who are qualified to vote but who, because of the way the rules were at the time, were not able to register, but you also have the fact that the impact of that regulation was that they could not only not vote in the next election, but in every subsequent election for the entire period of their incarceration. So it's not the 20-day the rule here, if someone registers within the 20 days, uh, it's true, they, will, they are not able to vote in the next election, and that is a burden, and we should consider that. But they, they are then registered and can vote in every subsequent election. So if it were a 60-day or 180-day deadline, you would say same standard. They, need, they, they just simply need to be thoughtful enough to do it on time. Uh, well, federal law, uh, for what it's worth, federal law limits registration periods to 30 days, the, the blackout period to 30 days. Um, so Fed federal statutory law? Federal statutory law, yes, the National Voter Registration okay. Act. Well, let's put that aside. Yes. I'm looking at your constitutional standard. Yes. Uh, apart from the federal law, any reason why it could not be 60 days or 120 days or 180 days if your standard is simply that a deadline is appropriate as long as you give people fair warning that they need to vote, that they need to register by that date, uh, there's no severe burden. So what I would say to that is that there are, uh, there are cases that support that approach. Um, there, okay, the, I, I, there the question is, do you say we should support that approach? I, I, I think it's, it's, utterly, it's, it's completely unnecessary to reach the question of an extremely long deadline, which you know, at some point, of course, it will be a much harder case. Again, these are all sort of matters of degree and So the length, the length matters. The length matters. The length matters, absolutely. And what I would say here is that because we have 20 days, which is on the shorter end of the 34, I think, states that still have this system, where there's a deadline and there's no election day registration, 20 days is on the shorter end of those states. Um, and as I've, as I've uh, said, the record shows that there really is, uh, there is a need for that in order to make sure that the early voting system is able to work uh, in a sort of orderly fashion. Uh, so that, that is why I think the 20 days is sort of a reasonable place to be. It, it is a reasonable way of advancing the state's legitimate interests in running an orderly election, compelling interests, I should say, in running an, or running an orderly election.
Did, um, did uh, Judge Wilson have before him? Wilkins. Uh, Wilkins have before him the um, uh, Secretary of State's position as it relates to the um, uh, election day registration. He did not. So did what not, do we, not. now we go back then to Justice Kafka's questions about fact finding and implementing it into whatever doctrine it might be, sliding scale, strict scrutiny, whatever it would be. How do we look at Judge Wilkins' decision without that factor in it? So I, I think, uh, Again, as I said to Justice Kafker, um, the, the fact finding regarding whether election day registration is or is not feasible to the extent that that's what uh, the opinion focused on, that has become something of a moot point. The secretary agrees that it's feasible. And, uh, you know, and, and there, there's, a, there's a also fact finding regarding the possible effect on turnout and that sort of thing. And, and let me just clarify, when you say that, you're saying that the same day registration is feasible, the election day registration, yes. but you're not saying elimination of the 20 day blackout is feasible. Correct, that's absolutely correct, Your Honor. Just making sure we yes. are all on the same page. Yes, yes, right. Uh, before you leave, uh, I know we've kept you longer than the usual 20 minutes. Uh, imagine the possibility that you will not prevail. I don't know whether or not you will or not, but imagine that possibility. Judge Wilkins did not address the issue of remedy. Right. We have an election coming up in November. Uh, what do you suggest that we do in the event we reach the issue of remedy? Um, that is perhaps a question better addressed to Ms. Rossman than to me, but I, I would say that... Be the, if, if we do issue remedy, you'll be the one you're... <laughs> Client will be the one asked to administer it, Correct. so it's appropriately uh, asked of you as well. Correct. Correct. <coughs> uh, so uh, I, I guess what I would say is that the uh, the, the 2018 election is uh, uh, is practically upon us now. Um, uh, most of the, for example, the secretary's bill has an effective date that would take it, or the secretary's proposal takes it after the 2018 election. So that the first, I believe, the first uh, statewide election that it would apply to would be 2020. Uh, and that would seem to me to be a, uh, a sensible approach to, so that there is not a scramble uh, to figure out uh, if it's left to the legislature to fix the problem. What we don't want, I would think, is a, is a decision from this court, which then goes to the legislature, they decide what to do with it, and, and then it sort of ping-pongs back and forth between the court and the legislature while we figure out what is a, a constitutionally feasible uh, uh, way of running the election. Meanwhile, time is ticking away. Clerks don't know what to do. They can't figure out who and who is and who is not registered. You still haven't answered the question, though. What are we supposed to do if we do we reach the issue of remedy? Are we supposed to say we'll let the legislature do it if they, as long as they do it within a certain time frame? Are we supposed to say whatever we do should not apply to the 2018 election, but should apply only to the 2020 election? Should we establish some? guidelines as to what you think is feasible uh, with regard to your bill. We, again, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure whether we're going to reach the issue, right. but uh, I am well aware that the November 18 election is coming up and we need to make it work. Right. Uh, so uh, I guess what I would say is I think that uh, not putting a new rule in effect until the 2020 statewide election would probably be a, a good idea. In general, I think and that... Your, and, uh, your sister, and your sister will say that if we declare it to be unconstitutional, that will permit an unconstitutional limitation to be in force for an upcoming election. But it does, I mean, again, to return to the theme at, at the opening, uh, there is a question of what is the proper province of the courts versus the legislature. But I'm, 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 the, the assumption is, which again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that I know right. the outcome of this case, I really don't. Uh, is that we find it unconstitutional. Correct. So we will have, we, we don't reach the issue of remedy yeah. unless no, and, we and make I a determination that it has been found unconstitutional. Well, uh, I guess what I would say is the plaintiffs did not seek a specific remedy. Justice Wilkins did not apply a specific remedy. And I think perhaps that is the approach that this court ought to take, which is to, uh, if, if the court should declare it unconstitutional, to do so, but to take the approach that it has taken in other cases, which is to say we, uh, we assume that the elected officials will uh, do what they're supposed to do, bring the law into compliance according to whatever instructions uh, the court may lay down. But it's obviously a function of the reason why 
the court should uh, make a declaration of uh, unconstitutionality. What would the court do in Florida? They must have had to act quickly. Yes, in Florida, the order was to extend the period so that once uh, mail had started being delivered again and offices had opened, uh, people could then go in and register. That was the remedy in that case. So in a sense, they had a shortened blackout period. In Florida, that was the remedy. That was the yes. remedy. Yes, yes, correct. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rossman, good morning. Good morning, Your Honor, and may it please the court. We've been talking a lot about the Secretary's proposal, but as Mr. Kravitz um, and myself agree, what is before this court is whether the existing law is unconstitutional, and for at least two reasons, it is. First, Mr. Kravitz spoke to you a lot about federal jurisdictions, but under our state constitution's enumerated right to vote, which has no federal analog, the voter cutoff law triggers heightened scrutiny. Second, in light of the extraordinary record in this case, and I hope to talk to with you about that today, under any applicable standard of review, the voter cutoff law fails. And that is because there is no evidence that this 20-day deadline is necessary, warranted, or even rational, and plenty of evidence that the clerks already can and do prepare for elections in far less time. Now, as we put out in our briefs, we believe the appropriate standard of review here is some form of heightened scrutiny. So does that scrutiny. mean all the other 35 states are unconstitutional um, that don't have same-day registration? Two responses, Your Honor. First, this case isn't about whether or not same-day registration is going to well, be required. Well, I know, but you're, you, you seem to be saying, if it's not rational, I'm just trying to understand, I mean, is everybody else unconstitutional? I can't speak, Your Honor, to how those courts have interpreted their enumerated mm -hmm. right to vote, but how this court has interpreted Article Three, it has never applied mere rational basis review. I know, um, but you just said right. you just said it's irrational, and I just I have trouble with that um, because having an orderly election is clearly rational. Whether you need twenty days or fifteen or ten, I don't know, but those are the type of decisions we usually leave to the legislature. That's correct, Your Honor, and it should be left to the legislature about what should replace the voter well, cutoff. Well, no, but I mean the down. number. I mean, whether it takes 20 days or 10 or five, uh, I'm just, there, there's sort of an emphasis in the trial judge's decision that because you can do same day, you know, better government should be put in place. Uh, it just, that seems to be a strong I don't think Part. this court needs to go that far, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. And what's critical here is what this record says about 20 days. And setting aside same day registration, there's plenty of evidence about what the clerks in this Commonwealth already do to show that at the least 20 days is nowhere close to what they need. There's already a law that requires them to prepare for elections in just five days. And the uncontroverted record is that they are meeting that law. The director of elections said it was a huge success. All three of the local clerks who testified said they were able to comply. And uh, the Somerville commissioner of elections who was cited earlier by Mr. Kravitz, he said with the fourth highest turnout in the Commonwealth that it was a huge success and they were ready for every voter to walk through the doors during early voting. And as further well, there, evidence- the, Even the secretary's new proposal doesn't go that far, right? He's, he's reserving the right to not have early registration, I mean, early voting and same-day registration. He's, he's, he, he doesn't think he can do those two things, right? Whether or not both of those things would need to be in place at the same time, Your Honor, I agree that would be a question for the legislature. It's possible that a solution they could come up with is to say, look, there is a deadline for being able to participate in early voting. Mm -hmm. And if you don't meet that deadline, then you can participate in same-day registration. But that kind of question, we agree with Mr. Kravitz, is for the legislature. The question that's for this court is whether those 20 days right now is supported. And you would be hard-pressed to find a record that provides less support for a challenged regulation than what we have before this court today. In addition to early voting, 
we know that the secretary is instructing clerks to continue to process immediately upon receipt registration forms that they receive, and they're doing it. The Revere clerk, in fact, testified that her office processed every single registration they received after the deadline immediately upon receipt. However, the voter cutoff law requires the Commonwealth to then go into the statewide database and remove those confirmed constitutionally qualified voters from the voter rolls. And any law that's requiring that kind of software to exist would fail any applicable standard, let alone the heightened scrutiny that this so court that will always apply. Is that one of the remedies apply. you're requesting that we declare that we allow the people that were actually registered within that time period to vote? Would that be part of your remedy you're seeking here? The remedy that we're seeking, Your Honor, is limited to a declaration about what those 20 days, whether or not they are constitutional or not. And to get back to Chief Justice Gant's uh, question earlier about remedy, we agree that the orderly administration of elections is a compelling interest, and we want the legislature to get this right, not rushed. So we certainly think it would be within this court's province to declare that the voter cutoff law is unconstitutional and issue a stay of a period of time to enable the legislature to put something in place. So you that agree that then there's a compelling interest in an orderly election, and then the question is whether the 20 days is necessary. Are we to apply the sliding scale test, the one I read earlier, or are we to apply scrut strict scrutiny? To this. We do believe, Your Honor, that the narrowest way that this court can decide this case is to apply Kaneen's necessity test for registration deadlines. To apply which one? Kaneen's necessity test for registration deadlines. Hold that the 20 days. So we should adopt an 1886 but test? Wasn't that about the, um, the people who were naturalized? The original qualification, Your Honor, that was before the court in Keene was about the naturalized citizens, but the court went on to address what would happen in a generalized registration requirement. And it set forth a test for that kind of registration deadline. And it said it could be no further than necessary to have the orderly elections and confirm voter qualifications. And there are good reasons why we would treat voter registration deadlines with especially exacting scrutiny. And that's because they're unique amongst voting regulations. Unlike almost any other voting regulation and unlike any voting regulation in Massachusetts, of which I'm aware, they alone prohibit from voting constitutionally qualified voters who show up on election day at the polls. And if Article 3's enumerated right to vote is going to mean anything, it should mean that if the legislature establishes a requirement that turns away constitutionally qualified voters on election day, that should trigger some form of heightened scrutiny. And we believe Kaneen sets forth the appropriate test for this court to apply. But to get back to your earlier question, Justice Kaffer, even if the sliding, excuse me, even if that necessity test does not apply here, we believe that this record, which is unparalleled in its lack of support for those 20 days, would still fail under that sliding scale test. And that's because this court needs to look at both what, how, what it takes to comply with the deadline, as well as the consequences of non-compliance, which here is complete disenfranchisement during an election, on the order of thousands of voters but, every but, election I mean, cycle. I mean, I, I mean, a citizen has a, a fundamental right to vote, but they also have a responsibility, right, to register to vote. And, and I'm just, essentially you're saying, I, I, I keep coming back, you're saying that if you show up on the day of voting, you should be allowed to vote. And that may be good policy, but is that, I mean, we're not preventing any of these people from voting. We're saying you have to act responsibly and register to vote in a timely way. We agree, Your Honor, that there can be a registration deadline under our Constitution. Caven speaks directly to that. Uh, but focusing on the ease of compliance so, with filling. So there can be one, and then the question is, what's a necessary one? You're saying 20 days is um, not necessary, but you're also saying, I'm just not sure what you're leaving us with, because then we have to pick a number? Two no, days, three days, 15 days? I mean, I'm just trying to understand what we have to do then. 
No, Your Honor. That is an appropriate question for the legislature, and there we agree with what the Secretary is saying. But what this court can and must do is exercise judicial review over that 20-day deadline. And because of the state of this record, there's simply nothing that is supporting those 20 days. In fact, there's not a single— And, and which fact-finding? Because, I, I mean, Mr. Kravitz, I think, pointed out that the record is not that specific. There, there is some fact-finding saying that it's good policy to have same-day registration, but there's not really specific fact-finding on how much time it really will take, is there, to do this? How much what lead time there needs to be in this? If, if there is, I'd like you to point me to the facts that we should focus on on that. No, the facts, Your Honor, in this case appropriately focused on whether 20 days was necessary, and it didn't try to establish what the least number of days would be possible in order for the clerks to comply, but not a single clerk testified during a four-day trial, and the secretary put up three local clerks, the director of the elections division, and an election specialist who focuses on early voting, and not a single one said that they were worried about being able to prepare in less than 20 days, that they thought 20 days was a good idea, that they thought it was impossible to do it in less than 20 days. That sets this case apart from all of the federal cases that the, the secretary cites, as well as New Jersey, because in each of those cases, the opinion cited to record evidence from at least one government official who said that the requested remedy was impossible. And I want to emphasize that New Jersey is not identical to the question before this court. There, the appellant asked the court to find that election day registration was constitutionally required, and an intermediate appellate court applying the New Jersey state constitution found that that was not required when you had record evidence from a government official saying it was impossible to do election day registration. Here, the appellants are simply saying that 20 days are unconstitutional when there's not a single clerk who is saying that it is necessary to have those 20 days, and there's plenty of evidence that they're doing it in far less time. But, but didn't, did any of the clerks testify that this is a better system, that it allows registration in an orderly way, and at the same time, it also allows early voting for people who have registered? I, I'm, you know, I, I understand they may not have testified it wasn't impossible, but did they testify in favor of the existing system? I mean, do we have any fact finding saying it presents a balance of considerations? In, on this record, Your Honor. Yes. No, there was testimony, Your Honor, that the clerks were busy, but taking the clerks at their own word, they also said, if the law requires it, we'll get it done. That's exactly what Somerville explicitly said, that if there were heightened burdens placed on the clerks, they would find a way to get it done because they had the capacity, and that's what the Constitution and the law would require them to do. Um, so what this court needs to simply find is, is looking at those 20 days on this record, um, which is unique in its, its lack of support for that 20 day deadline, that those 20 days are not constitutionally, um, are not constitutional, excuse me, under our enumerated right to vote, and send it to the legislature to determine what would be appropriate. Let's talk about the standard again for a moment. And, um, and Kaneen, because I think it, Kaneen says reasonable and necessary, and then you've got Kaplan originally from 1830-something, and then we never see necessary again in, in, in the cases. And uh, I know you think you'd win under any standard, put aside waiver and rationality for a moment, but um, I, the standard might very well uh, matter, and I'm not sure I see that there is a necessity standard uh, in our case law. Sure, Your Honor. The cases that use the term reasonable do not use those as a synonym for rational basis or sliding scale. And Kameen actually goes forward and provides a definition about what reasonable would mean within the context of a registration deadline. Um, and and it what says is that? That, Your Honor, would go to a registration deadline not being just unless it was no further than necessary. Where is that in Kameen? What page? Your Honor, if you uh, turn, it's at 920, excuse me, if you're using the mass site, it's at 502, um, where the court, after um, discussing the naturalization qualification, goes on to say, every system re of registration of voters contemplates that the registration will be completed and that the list of voters will be prepared before voting actually commences. No system would be just that did not extend the time of registration 
up to a time as near that of actually depositing the votes as would be consistent with the necessary preparation for conducting the election in an orderly manner and with a reasonable scrutiny of the correctness of the list. So we believe that's actually the definition of reasonable for registration deadlines. But even if this court disagrees, any definition of reasonable, under any definition, excuse me, of reasonable would require some assessment of the record for the government's justification for the, registra for the regulation that is uh, disenfranchising thousands of voters. Um, and on this record, the voter cutoff law simply can't satisfy any definition of reasonable that this court could come up with. Again, because there is no one who's saying that it's even a good idea who's administering that law there are plenty of reasons and plenty of evidence to show that they are actually doing it in far less time. And every election cycle, what we know this does is disenfranchise thousands of voters. There were 5,500 voters who registered in between the deadline and election day in 2016, and more than 7,000 voters who registered in that time in the same, uh, excuse me, during that same period in 2008 and 2012. And under our Massachusetts Constitution, that needs to trigger some form of heightened scrutiny. And even if it didn't, this record would fail uh, to support the voter cutoff law, even under rational basis review. The secretary is asking this court to do something unprecedented. The, the chief raises the question, the hours. So we'd get more people registered if we kept the polls open till midnight. Is that necessary? Because people are being disenfranchised because they've got to work, right? Your Honor, under the narrowest articulation of the test that would apply here, this court's decision wouldn't need to address voting hours or early voting well, but or why voting not? poll well, why locations. Is it, why, is, why is not keeping the polls open until 10? That would, it's not necessary to close it at eight, right? With new technology, we could get this counted more quickly, couldn't we? People can work later. I assume the clerks will work till 10 if we ask them. Is that constitutionally necessary? If this court is applying a strict scrutiny test, Your Honor, that, that turns on whether or not the uncontroverted record shows that thousands of voters are disenfranchised, that might trigger strict scrutiny if there is such a record. But this court wouldn't need to address that issue if it limits its holding to registration Trying to apply deadlines. the standard you want us to apply to that, to the hours of the polls. Is that, is it your view that's constitutional? Under a test, Your Honor, that turns on the uncontroverted record and its demonstration of how many voters were disenfranchised, perhaps it would be unconstitutional on that record. But I, I do want to emphasize okay, our- me, How about, so college students don't vote, right? So we know that they vote terribly. Do we have to put a polling station in the UMass? I mean, I, I'm just trying to understand, because that would, a lot of students would vote if we had a polling station right there, right? I'm just trying to understand how far your, your rule requires, because this rule of necessity, if somebody wouldn't vote who would vote, I'm just trying to get a sense of how far it goes. Yes, Your Honor, and I think that, that when we're talking about a necessity test of being no further than necessary, that it actually bakes in the fact that that is talking specifically to registration deadlines. And that for that reason, that test would not need to apply to these hypotheticals that you're speaking to, and there are good reasons Well, the for I mean, registration is not any different than the hours of the polling, is it? It is slightly different, Your Honor, and that is because in all of these other situations that you're talking about, whether it be having a polling location on a campus or the voting hours, those at least preserve the opportunity for the voter to be able to vote while the, elect, while the polls are still open, if they can get there. And I understand there may be some hurdles, but mm. that opportunity is preserved. The registration deadline in Massachusetts alone tells voters nearly three weeks before election day, there's absolutely nothing you can do to participate in this election, even if the state has actually confirmed your qualifications already and entered you into the statewide database. So while we believe Article Three may extend strict scrutiny further, there are reasons for this court to be able to limit its holding just to registration deadlines under that necessity test, which this voter cutoff law fails. Uh, you, were, you, you probably took legal history before, more recently than I did. Uh, am I correct that the constitutional jurisprudence with regard to fundamental rights and least restrictive alternative evolved after 1880? 
Yes, Your Honor, that's my recollection as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the SJC in 1880 did not have the usual formulation of what we now consider to be how we evaluate the constitutionality of some burden on a fundamental right. That's correct, Your Honor. Uh, so uh, this term, so the question is if we say, well, that was an early form of least restrictive alternative uh, and we decide to adopt least restrictive alternative as opposed to necessity, does it change anything? I don't believe so, Your Honor, for the purposes of the question that this court would need to address. Now, the legislature is going to have to determine what law would end up meeting the standard that this, this court sets forth. Um, but on this record, for this court, either of those tests would mean that the voter power law, law would fail. And, and, and what if we decided to pursue it to be analogous to time, place, and manner and asked whether it was narrowly tailored to accomplish the an orderly election with integrity. Again, Your Honor, on this record, I think that wouldn't change this court's analysis because of the lack of the record support um, for a 20-day deadline and all of the evidence that this court has before it about what the clerks are already able to do that, again, may uh, impact what the legislature is going to pass. But with respect to a declaration on the 20-day deadline under any of those standards, because of the unparalleled lack of support in the record, the voter peril law would fail. All right, I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked your brother. Uh, assume for the moment that you prevail in persuading us that the 20 day deadline is unconstitutional. You say that's all we need to do uh, and then the legislature can take it from there, but would it not be reasonable for the legislature in that circumstance to say, it would sure be nice, SJC, if you gave us some <coughs> guidance in this regard, because if we said it's a 19 day, we're gonna change the 20 days to 19 days, would you be content? Uh, absolutely, Your Honor. This court can <coughs> issue guidelines at the same time that it is issuing and, a declaration. And what, well, let me ask you, if they said 19 days, would you be content? Your Honor, it would of course depend on the record, but we know what we know from okay. this record. But it, but there is certainly the risk that if they say 19 days, you're back. It's possible, Your Honor. Okay. So <laughs> so uh, uh, I I I've never been a legislator, but they're reasonable people, and it's fair for them to say we whatever we do, we would like to make sure that you're not going to be back. Uh, so what guidance should we give the legislature if we were to do what you want us to do? I think it's twofold, Your Honor. The first is to set forward the standard that this court is applying. Now, of course, as you've heard me say several times at this point, we think the standard could be confirming to means no further than necessary. However, least restrictive or narrowly tailored uh, would also provide the legislature with some guidance about what would be appropriate. The second piece is that we already have a benchmark right now in the record, which is the fact that early voting was an uncontroverted success in the Commonwealth. And that establishes a, a, a benchmark, as I said, for the legislature that they would need to put forward a very strong record about why something more than five days may be required, given the record that has already been established in this case. All right, thank you.